Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to this postmortem of my Blitz game number 565. I had the white pieces and played e4. And we get into a Rui Lopez after the normal moves. e5, knight f3, knight c6, defending the pawn, and bishop b5, the characteristic move of the Rui Lopez. Now there are a lot of uh, different defenses here. The top choices are a6, the mainline uh, Morphe defense, knight f6, the uh, Berlin defense. Um, there are other uh, Moves you can play, f5 is the Schliemann Gambit, it's kind of interesting. Uh, d6 is known as the uh, Steinitz defense. Um, d6 is not played so much nowadays. Uh, normally, players, even players who like that setup, will usually throw in a6 first and then play d6. That's known as the uh, deferred Steinitz or the modern Steinitz. Um, so this is the old Steinitz or maybe the original Steinitz. Anyway, um, it uh, is a playable opening. It's similar to the Philidor defense. It leaves uh, black with a little bit of a uh, cramped setup here, but he can get all his pieces out. And uh, the normal way of continuing was with bishop d7. But I think um, taking is not bad, actually, um, if you do it with the right idea. There's also an idea in the Philidor defense. You're, you're giving up the center, but uh, you buy yourself a little bit of time to, to get your pieces out. So let's see, I took back with the knight. It is funny, you can actually take back with the queen here because of the, uh, the pawn, uh, the pin on the knight, but uh, I took back with the knight. I think that would provoke more exchanges when you take with the queen, and I, I want to keep pieces on. Um, and of course, it is a general rule that uh, when you have more space, you want to keep the pieces on, and the uh, player that uh, has less space wants to uh, uh, exchange pieces in order to free his position. But, uh, well, right near, right here, black goes for some wholesale exchanges, and it's just a mistake in this position. He really needs to uh, continue developing with knight f6, and like I said, he will get a, a cramped but uh, playable position, also bishop e7. Um, I guess those moves can be played in either order. Um, and yeah, he's got a, a quiet setup here. His pieces are all confined to the three rows, but, but every piece gets out, he'll be able to castle and um, you know he can push back against the center or provoke trades at uh, at a moment of his choosing. Basically, these trades are are kind of sitting there on the board waiting to be made. Uh, but he makes the trades right now. And um, if you just look ahead a few moves, you'll see that. Uh, let's see. Well, I could have taken here with a check, but I, I took this way. It's an okay way to play as well. And he takes, and then I take. And uh, at the end of the sequence, you see that not only do I have more space, but now I have the only, the only developed pieces on the board. All the black's pieces are on the back row. So, um, so he's, uh, you know, traded off some pieces according to that uh, old rule about uh, you want to trade pieces when you're in a cramped position. However, you always have to look ahead at the uh, resulting uh, position after the trades, and you can see that uh, white has a pretty good edge here, uh, just because of his. Uh, development. So it was a little bit hasty, those trades. A little bit too soon. So he kicks my knight, though. That's, that's good. Gets him a tempo and gets his knight out to f6. So he gets gets a piece out. I castle and he goes bishop e7. And I put my rook here. I'm thinking of pushing ahead. Okay, I was wondering, you know, as I did a quick survey, it seemed my advantage kind of dropped at various places, but I think I keep the, an edge most of the way through this. He goes ahead and castles, so sequence here is pretty logical. Oh, it's the h3 move here. It's a bit of a time waster. Yeah, I should probably just go ahead and develop this bishop next. Bishop g5, bishop f4, even bishop d2. Just get on with the, the business of developing my pieces. Um, so I'm not sure why I played this h3. <laughs> um, but uh, at this point, uh, black is uh, not too bad uh, badly off. Let's see, he shouldn't respond with h6. He should play um, a little more actively here. Yeah, bring his rook to the center, rook e8. Okay, so I kind of waste a tempo, and then he gives it back to me, basically. <laughs> and then I bring my bishop out. He goes knight h7. He had an idea with this uh, h6 move, which is to uh, reroute his knight to a different square. Or maybe he's just getting his knight out of the way to push the f-pawn forward. Uh, another kind of freeing maneuver and also going for some activity on the king side. But it's a little bit slow, and uh, you know he's retreating his pieces when they're already behind in development. So... Queen b4 looks like an interesting move. Uh, suggestion from the chess engine, just hitting hitting the weak b pawn and uh, keeping keeping some pressure on the center. But I think uh, rook to d1 can't be bad. Yeah, that's that's the other choice. I just get all my pieces out, the rooks on the center, and uh, my remaining pieces on the board. 
looking for activity. He goes bishop f6, trying to uh, harass my queen a bit. I drop back, and uh, then he trades. <laughs> you know, he's just gotten this bishop to a good square, and he gives it up for a knight that's sitting over here and is not yet really uh, participating in the game. So that's another kind of mistake. Um, these trades really are not helping him in spite of that rule about uh, <laughs> trades trades and cramped positions um, they're just uh, the trades he's doing are, are not not particularly good ones okay so he brings his rick over here to defend the c-pawn he'll free his queen up to move uh, let's see I go queen b3 taking a look at the b-pawn and uh, getting out of the glare of his rook he goes b6 and now I push on with e5 yeah He's, uh, I've just got this pin on the uh, D file here, and I'm going to exploit that. And that was also the uh, queen move to B3 had two objects. It was hitting the uh, B7 pawn, but it was also taking a look at the, uh, the D5 square. So now when I play E5, he can't push his pawn forward. And uh, I think I'm just winning from here. So let's see, where was the last move? I mean, he made a bunch of bad trades, so his position was already going downhill. Um, but uh, right here, let's see, my last move. After taking his bishop, what should he try here? Instead of rook c8, queen to d7, getting his queen off the back rank, and maybe he can play on at some kind of uh, disadvantage. Yeah, I still have this idea of playing e5, but now he can play d5 here. And if I were to play queen b3 on this line, play b5, e5. Queen f5. Hmm. Yeah, I have to take a moment to uh, defend my bishop. So I'm not immediately renting material. And then he goes rook, rook to e8. Yeah, I'd still create some pawn weaknesses here. But uh, he can trade rooks here, and, and I don't actually win a pawn. I just, uh, just managed to create an isolated pawn here, which I can attack later. So a good position for white. Uh, and uh, maybe even still winning because this, that's such a weak pawn there. But uh, anyway, that's his best try at this point. But his uh, point is his position has already really gone downhill <laughs> because of uh, because of those all those trades that he made, those inappropriate trades. So anyway, don't just blindly follow those chess rules. Uh, think for yourself a little bit. Okay, so he defends this pawn. I, I play queen b3, and now... Uh, uh, let's see, he plays b6. So I guess he could still, okay, come out with queen f6 and get, get some kind of game here. But uh, then b6 is the move that gives it all away because that allows this e5 move. Queen h4, he tries to come out with his queen and harass my bishop, but that doesn't work because my bishop can drop back and hit his queen. Yeah, and the, the bishop and the uh, pawn are covering these squares like... Uh, f6 and uh, g4, so queen couldn't come out anywhere. Anyway, so I get to drop my bishop back with tempo as queen has to move again, and now I'm just uh, winning a pawn here in the center, and uh, this is an important pawn. Let's see, I could uh, have played c3 there, but uh, I think taking right away is not bad. It was queen f5, looking at my c pawn, so provoking c3 anyway, so now this pawn is pretty secure, and I can play the rest of the game with this extra pawn. So let's, let's go forward a few moves because there's not a whole lot going on. He gives up a second pawn over there. Let's see. Okay, let's ask first of all, could he have um, defended that pawn? Actually, knight f6 is one of the engine choices. If he plays b5, I take the a pawn. If he moves his rook to defend the pawn, that would be a try to hold on to his material. And uh, rook d5 hitting his queen. Or rook takes b6 anyway. Yeah, he can't hold on to the material. So yeah, he's already winning a second pawn. So this knight f6 move is, is already losing a second pawn. And his knight f6 move is probably as good as any. Um, so anyway, I, I grab the material. I trade the, the rooks off. And we get into an end game. And uh, so there's a pretty simple win. Bishop versus knight and two extra pawns. There was just one point of end game technique I wanted to point out here. You know, he, he does the right thing. He marches his king to the center. Um, it's just a good example of the coordination of the bishop. And uh, with the pawns, it's the bishop controlling this diagonal. It's uh, restricting his knight from coming over here to the queen side. And it's also uh, working together with these pawns and my king to keep his king from uh, penetrating. One key in many endgames, even when you're uh, <clears throat> ahead in material, you have to be careful 
about allowing your opponent's king to get active and get into your position um, because with the limited amount of resources available a, a, a king can be pretty destructive if it gets behind your line so keeping the king out is a key point here uh, let's see he played f5 probably coming in to harass my king but i get in this c4 move and this is what i mean the coordination of the uh, the bishop and the pawn forces his king uh, back. He could go to the side, but then I could kick him with another pawn move, so his king drops back. And uh, I, I maintain control of all these squares with the coordination of the bishop and the pawn. So just a, a little point of in-game technique, uh, but I mean, it was a, a winning in-game anyway, but you still have to be careful. As long as there's a knight on the board, there are possibilities for tricks, but uh, with the two extra pawns, you know, I don't have to worry about any trades. I just have to worry that, um, you know, I don't walk into any forks and give up material. So uh, at this point, uh, the b6 pawn is winning. And after this move, uh, 93, yeah, I just push on to b7. Um, there was even a point here where, um, where was it? Yeah, <laughs> I just thought this was funny. He, he moved his pawn forward to uh, f4 to attack my bishop here. And uh, I just moved my bishop back. I mean, I'm still winning in any case, but the chess engine points out my position is so so far advanced that I could actually just uh, push this pawn forward any anyway and ignore the threat, ignore the threat to the bishop. But the way I played is fine. Just drop back and then push the pawn. And at this point, he resigned. So um, interesting game. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, leave any comments you have in the section below, and I will see you again soon. Bye.